is the required book for this course. And so we're going to be talking about audits in this lecture, and we're going to be looking at different practices and uh, ways to do audits, why we do audits, uh, the data that we're going to be logging, and, and how this is going to be used to help us to monitor, uh, test our security, and ensure compliance with the different requirements uh, that we have. So um, keeping in mind that, you know, we want to prepare to try to avoid uh, security breaches in the future. And so one of the ways that we prepare for that is by doing risk management, uh, something that we've already spoken about, but also to ensure that we have the accurate controls and mechanisms and internal controls in place we're going to need to test that. And so one of the formalized ways that we do that is through the security audit process. Uh, we'll basically do two kinds of, of uh, auditing processes. We'll do some tests and some of them are going to be done manually. So by a person going in and doing a certain number of things, perhaps on the basis of some kind of statistical random, randomized evaluation and uh, another part is going to be automated, so we're going to be using some tools and hopefully by now in the labs you've already started using these different tools that are available to us. And so by combining this, all this information, then we could try to figure out uh, what are the potential vulnerabilities or weaknesses or what are the things that we can improve. So the audit is a very important process part of our security plan because this is going to be providing feedback. If you remember from previous lectures where we talked about the risk management process, there was a feedback loop. Uh, we had a little mention called audit on it, and it's the idea that this is providing us information that is going to allow to us to improve. So uh, a few things that we're going to be looking at are security policies sound and appropriate for the business or activity. So here the purpose of information security is to support the mission of the business and to protect it from the risks it faces. So with respect to security, one of the most visible links is that of the data breach. So our organizational policies supporting documents define the risk that affect it. So supporting documents include the organization's procedures, standards, baseline. So when we conduct an audit, we're asking the question, are our policies understood and followed? The audit itself doesn't set the new policies, but the auditors might, however, make recommendations based on experience or knowledge of new regulations or other requirements. Then are the controls supporting our policies? So as the security controls align correctly with the organization's strategies and mission, do the controls support the policies and culture? If we can't justify a control by a policy, then maybe we don't need to have that there. So whether a control is explained as for security, but with no other explanation, then also perhaps it shouldn't be re removed. Security is not a profit center, and it should never exist for its own sake. It's a support activity, and its purpose is to, to support, to protect the organization's assets and the revenue streams. And then finally, is there effective implementation and upkeep of controls. So as the organization evolves and threats mature, it's important to make sure that all our controls meet the risk that we're facing at this point in time. So these are some of the, the key questions uh, that uh, should be coming out of the, uh, the audit process. Uh, so we're gonna, it, audit is an ongoing thing. It's not a, a one of. It's something that's going to be in, built into a, I guess, a Deming circle, continuous improvement, uh, process improvement uh, cycle. So it's something that's going to happen. Perhaps there's going to be a cycle to it, uh, like a timed cycle to it, maybe like a yearly audit, but it's really something that's happening in real time. So we monitor, we review, we measure all the controls to capture actions and changes on the system. We audit, we review the logs and the overall environment to provide independent analysis on how well the security policies and the control work. Typically, it's, there's two parts of that. There's the internal audit by, done by our own teams and the external audit, third party, 
perhaps a CPA or a chartered accountant organization or, or a CISA, computer information security auditor uh, a person who's going to, a group who's going to come in and do that. We're going to improve, so we're going to include proposals uh, in the audit process to improve the security program and the controls. And we're going to try to uh, apply then the recommended changes as they are accepted and negotiated and discussed and proposed to our management. And then we're going to secure, we're going to ensure that the new and existing controls work together to protect to the intended level of security. Always the idea of acceptable risk that has been uh, discussed many times before in this course. So we're going to want to determine what is acceptable and what is, what is unacceptable. Remember, we're talking about unacceptable risk as being at the base of what is the definition of security. And so we're going to try to define that and better understand that. And then based on that, we're going to create standards, directives, standard operating procedures, documentation, policies, uh, uh, but we're going to also we're going to be looking to best practices. We're going to be looking to international standards, uh, international associations, groups that are creating the, the standards. We're going to communicate. So communications and other actions that are going to be permitted by the policy, and we're going to find those as acceptable. And then communications and other actions that are specifically banned, which are going to be defined as unacceptable. So this is part of, you know, one of the components of what's going to happen as part of the audit process. So uh, we can have different kinds of audits. We can have a very high level, very large in scope audit that's going to cover entire departments or business functions. Or on the other end, we could have narrow uh, audits that are going to address only one specific system or one specific control. Uh, the audit provides management with independent assessments of whether the best controls are in place and how well they work, okay, which is going to help us to better understand and better address the risk. So depending on what the specific requirement is, what the different roles of the different systems are, the structure of the organization, the nature of the different systems, you know, we may want to look at it. Well, not we may. We probably will have a, a one audit process that's going to be on an organizational level then we may have a need to go for specific systems into more specific, uh, narrow uh, aspects. So, for example, a large financial institution who has some compliance issues and conformity issues with credit card processes and needs to implement something called the PCI standard for credit cards may have an audit specifically geared towards credit card processing and personal information of customers PII, personal identifiable information uh, related to credit cards may be part of one specific narrow audit, whereas they may be a, a global audit by external auditors and internal and external auditors, which relate to the organization as a whole, perhaps in the preparation or the validation of an annual report. So uh, at a high level, the, the things that we're going to be looking at is do we have the right controls in place? Are those controls put in place correctly? And do we, and how effective are these controls in addressing the risk that, it, that they were designed to try to address? One kind of report that organizations do that many organiza large organizations do is called the SOC report. So it's important to understand what this is. Uh, it's a verifiable auditing report that is performed by a CPA, a Chartered Certified Public Accountant. And it's typically a part of the offering of CPAs. So uh, as, as we have a lot of students here who uh, are, are studying to work in the accounting uh, sector or work for large, the large accounting firms, they would typically be involved in, in these type of, uh, of audits. So these are sort of like regulatory requirements for certain organizations to proceed with these types of audit. So we have three, SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3, that are important tools for uh, auditors. The SOC 1 report uh, primarily focuses on internal controls over financial reporting or, or the uh, international, the commonly referred to accounting rules, 
ICFR, things like that. Uh, this type of report is often used to prepare financial statements for the user organizations and to implement proper controls to ensure the confidentiality, the integrity, the availability of the data that's generated by the financial, the financial reporting systems. The SOC 2 and the SOC 3 reports both address primarily security-related controls. So the security-related controls in these reports are critical to the success of today's technology service provider organizations. The primary difference between SOC 2 and SOC 3 reports is their audience. SOC 2 reports are created for internal and other authorized stakeholders, and SOC 3 reports are intended for public con uh, consummation. So, you know, these are the kind of reports that perhaps you could find online if you're, if you're looking at, uh, at uh, the security, uh, security validation or confirmation of the levels of security that were put in place by perhaps your internet service provider or somebody that your organization is doing business with. So the way that this is going to happen, this audit, we're going to start by creating an audit plan. So uh, an idea of what it is that we're going to be doing. And so in there, in the audit plan, we're going to define our objectives. We're going to define what are the areas that we're going to cover. And we're going to define who's going to be participating in that process. Then we're going to define the scope. So remember before I talked about narrow or wide. So what is this, the scope exactly of what we're going to be doing? Then we're going to do a site survey, go around and look, try to get a, you know, a, a, the lay of the land, look at all the documentation that's there, looking at all the risk analysis work that's been done. So what are the risk uh, assessment reports and things like that, risk management processes, uh, that uh, what has come out from there. Then we're going to be looking at the logs. So the logs from the servers, the logs from the application, and these can be very big, so perhaps we're going to be using some data mining tools to try to help us with that. Maybe you know, we're going to develop some tools in-house if we do a lot of these that are going to be looking for specific patterns or, or known things. And then we're, going to have, we're also going to look at uh, different servers or systems may have incident logs. Maybe we have also an incident registry. Hopefully we do have an incident registry where we're going to log all of the problems that have happened. So we're going to look at that. And then we're going to do some pen testing. So in the pen testing, I don't know if we've already talked about red teams, uh, you know, pen testers, uh, intrusion testing that is being done by people in our organizations or maybe by third parties that we've hired, perhaps by an external accounting firm that may have some expertise in this is going to be coming in. And so as part of the audit, we're going to do that and we're going to look at the results. So keep in mind, when we're talking about the scope. We can look at it in, in, you know, in light of the domains that we've spoken about already in this. So these may be, that might be uh, one way that you can determine the scope in relation to these, uh, to these elements. We can also look to different benchmarks, so different frameworks. Uh, the most uh, common ones that uh, perhaps you may have seen um, ISO 27002, so this is an international standards organization, the ISO, and they have a standard called 27002, part of the 27000 family of standards, which covers cybersecurity. And so perhaps that's something that we can discuss further uh, in more detail in a later uh, module in this course when we're going to be talking about standards. But uh, this, uh, this standard has a lot of inter of controls that are, that are mentioned that we may want to use as a reference. The NIST has a cybersecurity framework. This is something that first came out in 2014 and following a, some work that was done by President Obama for cybersecurity. And it all, so this is the National Institute of Science and Technologies. And so there's a series of special publications of documents, standard documents. And these of course are American, so they for the US government but they're very much used worldwide in certain f sectors like the financial sector. Uh, these are considered very, very significant. Uh, ITIL, so the Information Technology Infrastructure Library. So this is a set of, of best practices, of guidelines, of books, of policies. And so there's a section in that as well. So many organizations refer to that. The ACASO, the Institute of Internal Auditors has uh, certain things 
And the one that we're looking at more in this course is COBIT, so the Control Objectives for Information and Related, related Technology. Uh, but I'm not going to go in too much detail here because actually we're going to have uh, a lot of di more discussions on COBIT over the next couple of weeks uh, in a lot more detail. And we'll be looking at the, uh, the COBIT as a reference uh, as we are uh, ISACA uh, approved uh, CIS pro program. So uh, different tools that we're going to use uh, for to collect the data that we're going to need. We're going to maybe send out some questionnaires, do some interviews. We're going to look around what's happening. Certainly, we're going to develop a whole bunch of checklists uh, that we're going to, to make sure that we don't forget anything. Looking at all the documentation, the configuration files, the policies, and, of course, security testing, which like for people like me that are a little bit more technical in nature, you know, this is something that we're much interested in and something that we will be doing in the labs using tools like Nessus and Nmap and other things that you're going to be using in the different labs that we have in this course. So uh, uh, we're going to be looking at different components of uh, cybersecurity, uh, antivirus, access policies, intrusion detection systems, and different event uh, monitoring systems that we have in place. We're going to look at crypto, at different crypto controls, and contingency planning. So the What's the business continuity plan? What's the disaster recovery plan? What are the continue the continue of operations plan? Uh, so these are all things that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the hardware, the software. What's the maintenance processes that are in place? Uh, the physical security. You know how the server rooms, the different closets, wiring closets uh, are they are they locked? What about power, access control? What's the principle in place? Uh, how do we have something called the least privileges? So make sure, make sure that people only have access to what they should have access to. Change control process, media protection, things like USB keys and things like that. All right, so these are all different things that really need to be looked at with a lot of attention. Uh, identity management, what's the approval process? How does someone get approval to access our systems? What are the mechanisms that we have in place? to ensure that only approved users get access. What about passwords? Because we know, you know that uh, you know, users are a tremendous vulnerability for organizations, but at the same time, we can't get rid of users. And so users need access, and how they get access typically is through user ID and password. But people don't use really good passwords. By na it's sort of human nature. So what can we do to try to make sure that they do? And that, how do we ensure that they really do? Then how do we monitor this? Uh, the identity management and act controls to detect unauthorized access. And what about remote access? You know, this year with everything that's going on and, and, and recently, you know, that's going to be a major concern for us. And then after the audit, we're going to do exit interviews. We're going to analyze the data. And most significantly, we're going to generate the audit report. So how we do that, what do we need to include in the audit report? And then how are we going to present this to the organization in the way that it's going to achieve its result? I mean, in the end, it's the organization that needs to decide what it is that they're going to do. You're there to make recommendations. Some of these recommendations, once they're made and they're written in the audit report, they become significant because now the, you know, that the organization has been told that they have this problem, they have to do something about it. If they choose not to do anything about it and so, and some kind of damage happens later, uh, you know, they can have a lot of problems. A lot of legal issues might arise at that point, lawsuits, etc. So, uh, you know, they may put pressure on the auditors, say, okay, you, please don't put this in the document. Or at the same time, they may lie, they may give misunder uh, information or not say everything, little white lies, or misdirect the auditors. Uh, in order that certain things don't be seen. So what is then the responsibility? How is that going to be taken under uh, consideration? Because really, you know, the intention is great, right? The goal of the audit is to improve our situation so we can manage risk in a better way. And that's wonderful. But the reality is we're dealing with people and people have different motivations and people want to save their jobs and people want to get their bonus. I mean, there's all these things that are going on. 
So uh, these need to be uh, taken under consideration. Um, so some of the aspects uh, of uh, that that uh, are important and that we need to look into are the aspects of monitoring. So uh, how are we going to be doing the the monitoring, right, uh, it, to make sure what's going on. And we can use tools to ensure that what we've the recommendations and, and the logs and the process that can happen, like the audit process can happen sort of like in real time. And we can be like a continuous improvement process. So how are we going to do that? And what are the kind of tools that we could implement in order to do that? So like a, a host intrusion detection system, something that's on the actual computers themselves. Some different systems to monitor system integrity. A DLP, data loss prevention systems, to prevent that sensitive information to uh, be divulged and be shared. And we can have some non-real-time stuff like uh, application logging, system logging, and then uh, host-based and network device and the network activity uh, logs as well. So some of the different types of log information that we need to capture, the event logs, so generated by the the OS and the applications, the access logs, so who's asking for accessing what, and so something that we can go and review later. All kinds of security logs, security related events, and then the audit logs uh, that will provide additional input to the audit activities. And so all of these have to be generated, produced, and also secured because, you know, if a hacker is going to hack into your system and then he's going to come in and change the log, then what's the point? And typically, that's what a good hacker would be doing, a cyber criminal would be doing, is go and erase any trace that he was there. So how do we ensure that that kind of thing's not going to happen? Because the logs are super important. So all these different logs are going to be going to these machines and to these logging hosts. So we want to be able to control that. And how do we verify uh, security controls? What are the, how do we ensure that we know what's happening in our IDS, our IPS, our firewall? Uh, so this is a, a critical function and something that needs to be validated as part of the, of the audit process. It's also, you know, when we get into the intrusion prevention systems, which is like an IDS and a firewall combined into one box, that it sees something and then it, put, it causes an action to happen. But how, you know, what are the controls that we have in the, uh, from an organizational point of view to ensure that these are reliable? And to ensure that you know there's no way that something can come around this, right? So, uh, the 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 really we're hoping that the firewall is going to block things that need to be blocked. But if it's not blocked, then we need the IDS uh, behind it, and the host IDS and the network IDS are going to be behind the firewall to tell us, okay, something came through, and you need to you need to do something about this very very quickly. That's the idea here, right? Same as if someone actually something actually gets to the workstation, then uh, you know the network IDS is going to be looking at the network. The host IDS is going to be looking at the host. So, uh, and uh, from the the host the network IDS, we can have something based on patterns. So basically, on business on rules, something based on uh, profiles, uh, looking for something that's strange and anomaly. And then we can use all kinds of methods based on statistical statistics or looking at the protocols or looking at the traffic happening on the network. So, uh, you know, as we go into more and more detail, as these machines are going to be slowing down, we do have to keep in mind that this may affect the performance of our network. And so we want to you know, make sure that we do this in, in the best possible way, considering what our requirements are. So from the host IDS thing, this is typically going to be part of some of like a Microsoft Defender suite or something that's going to be installed on the actual computers by the users. And so it's going to be looking at things coming into the machine itself or going out from the machine itself and try to detect something that's inappropriate, uh, abnormal. Uh, it may also be looking at rules, but you know things that in relation to a particular computer and the role of that computer on your network, the host computer, so a computer that is used by a person, so either the computer itself or the user. 
And here again, the idea, and I don't know if you saw the video I posted about the zero trust model, and, and but the idea is that we need to have multiple layers of defense, like the peels on an onion to protect from the center. And so this is the typical uh, strategy of having a trusted and untrusted network. So uh, I think this is sort of a, the cl a classic approach, I guess we could say. But I do urge that you go look the video on Zero Trust if you haven't already to try to understand uh, you know, how this is, is evolving. So we, we don't want to have a trusted network. We want to just not trust anything and then have in place mechanisms to ensure that everything that goes through has been verified. I mean, we have ways, we have tools, we have AI that can come and help us today in order to, uh, to do that in a different and much more efficient way. Uh, we can use the uh, uh, demilitarized zone or the DMZ in order to create an area on the network where external traffic uh, or traffic that we're not really sure how to, how much we should be trusting that. So traffic coming in from the internet would go through the DMZ and then our internal network would go to the DMZ. So imagine email coming in to a, to an email server that would be in the DMZ and then our users are re getting their mail from that server on the DMC. So again here, this is more of a sort of a classic approach. So when we're going to do this, we're going to want to secure all of our machine. And so the process to, in order to secure all the machines is known as system hardening. And so, so basically there's a few rules, but we're going to, you know, make sure that we disable what we don't need. So only keep the services that we really need on the machine. We want to secure all the interfaces, all the applications, the passwords, and we want very complex password strategies. We want to disable all the unnecessary user accounts. Make sure we have all the latest software patches uh, installed on the machine. Uh, make sure that the machines can't be changed, so no changes can happen without our authorization. In some cases, you know, I've seen computers that were set up, they were actually running off of a DVD that was read only and they would so they would create the 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 hardened environment and then they would burn it on the D, the DVD and the machine wouldn't even have a hard drive so it would be impossible to make any changes because they were hard, they were burnt onto this DVD so if they needed to make changes they'd need to create a new DVD and then boot the the server from the DVD i mean this is an extreme case but it's certainly a strategy that works and we want to disable the, the network interface that aren't being used, the service ports that aren't being used. We want to limit, use MAC address filtering to limit the device, the access of the device. So, and then there's all these other protocols that we can also look at uh, doing. We're going to want to monitor and to test the security system. So we're going to do, you know, attacks. We're going to simulate attacks because, uh, you know, attackers coming in from the outside with unauthorized access, ma malicious code, Trojan, malware, and we want to prevent this information from leaking from the inside. Again, things that we've already talked about quite a bit. So we're going to be monitoring the traffic with the IDS. We're going to try to identify abnormal stuff and which then we're going to investigate. And we'll use the IPS, the Intrusion Prevention System, to uh, block the stuff that we don't want in real time so uh, unnecessary so in the testing strategy right the host unnecessary services remove insecure services remove services service packs and service updates applied antivirus intrusion detection these privileges and then moving to an environment with where it's going to where it's going to be uh, we're going to be testing all of that and we're going to be scanning, and then when we find things, we're going to be fixing those things. So there's like a, a roadmap, there's a strategy for doing the security testing that is part of this uh, system hardening strategy. So first we're going to do some recon, then we're going to map out the network using some of the tools that you're using in the labs, then we're going to test for vulnerabilities, we're going to do some pen testing, and then we're going to act on that, we're going to do some mitigation. Again, here I refer you to the labs in which we're going to be going through that in a lot more detail. So we're going to, when we do that, we're going to set some goals. We're going to agree on some methods. We're going to give, perhaps in some cases, individuals uh, some authorizations in order to do that. 
And so part of our goal is going to be to identify the vulnerabilities, to rank the vulnerabilities. Again, here I refer you to the labs, but also to some of the other videos that I've put that talk about the CVEs, the common vulnerabilities, and the different databases, the MITRE attack uh, framework as well, that it will be important because that's where you're going to find more information about these and about these strategies. We're going to document, so we're going to take a point in time, we're going to document a snapshot of of the situation and then we'll do this uh, you know multiple times so over time we can see how the situation evolved if there's anything new are we doing better are we doing worse we're going to do some reviews and we're going to try to identify the gaps so some of the recon methods that we're going to use social engineering we're going to use different services that are out there on the internet uh, with like who is service or dns zone transfers and this is going to give us a lot of information about the network. Now, I implore you, do this in the labs. Please don't do this at home. Some of the things here, like, you know, some of these testing here that you could do on the Internet, in some cases, may be illegal and you might get you into trouble. So please be careful if you're doing that. Do it in the lab. So when we're mapping, we're sending and we're doing this with either Nessus, Nmap, or different tools that we're going to be using. Right. We're going to try to create, a, get an idea, get a picture of the map of the environment. We're also going to be using ping in order to help us with that. We're going to do some different types of scans, uh, SIN scans as well, some SIN hack uh, combinations. So try to get as much information as possible from the machines. And all of this information together is going to enable us to fingerprint. So. The idea being to try to identify what operating system is out there. So basically, we want to know as much as we can about the machine. And once we know everything that we need, that we know, that we can know, then this is going to help us to move on to the next stage. Try to figure out, okay, how can we actually try to get into this computer, right? So different testing methods, black box, so using uh, methods that aren't based on direct knowledge of the architecture or the design, white box. So based on knowledge of the design and the source code and gray box, somewhere between the two. Uh, and of course, there's the covert and the overt. So the IT external co contractors who are taking on the role of, an, of a hostile attacker. And that's the covert. And then the over is part of the internal team trying to do this in real time. And there may be a combination of both. So remember when we talked about the black hat, the gray hat, the white hat, the white hat are the overt. They're our people. The, the, gray, the covert may be more of gray hat. So they're really using, doing exactly what a hacker would be doing uh, to try to get into our network. But of course, he's doing it at our request and we have a contractual agreement and perhaps our lawyers have also given them a letter authorizing them just in case the police comes knocking at their door. And so that's what we're trying to do here. So we're, so some key things, uh, tips and, and techniques, some key things that you got to keep in mind. Choose the right tools. Tools aren't perfect, so make sure that you know what you're doing. And try to you know use perhaps multiple tools to uh, because some of the tools are, aren't going to be perfect, but also some of these tools, if not used properly, can cause serious damage. Like you know stop your your server your website from being uh, functional. So make sure that you have protections in place, but do try to make the test as real as they can be. So there we go. That's the. Uh, the, this, uh, p the part of the lecture for this week uh, covering uh, this uh, section of the book. Thank you.